$30 for six months. So no, it's not really in my budget, thanks, thanks anyway. So well, if it's a money thing, then I guess today only, I can cut the price in half and do $15 for three months. <laughs> so I'd tell him, listen, I'm not a math doctor, but I think that's the same price, man. <laughs> um, anyways, long story short, like I decided if my trial was about to expire, I needed to maximize every last second that I could listening to the 90s channel on Sirius XM. And don't even give me judgy faces. I know all of you who are older than me are like, that's not even a good decade of music. And all of you high school, middle school students are like, do you listen to music from the 1900s? I wasn't even alive in the 1900s. And whatever, it's nostalgic. But there's this one song that, that played this week that really struck me. And I, as I was thinking about this morning and this message in this series, we're in, it just kind of profoundly impacted me. It was this 1995 hit by Joan Osborne called One of Us. And the basic premise of the song is asking this question, what if God was one of us? And she says, what if God was one of us, just a slob like one of us, just a stranger on a bus trying to make his way home? And all of you who grew up in the 90s are going to have that stuck in your head the rest of the day. I'm not even sorry. Um, but, but I couldn't help but think about, like, we, we may use different words, but I think like across time and space, that's a pretty profoundly human question. There's something inside all of us that wonders, is there a God out there? And if there is, does God understand what it's like to be us? Like struggling and fighting through this thing we call life. I think the beauty of Christianity, the heart of Christianity is that the answer to that question is yes. God knows exactly what it's like to be one of us because God became one of us. And the implications of that are, are huge, not just for our lives, as we are able to confidently approach a God who understands our pain and understands our frustration, but also the implications are huge for the way we relate to the shattered world around us who's desperate to, to know and be loved. We're in week two of this series, Won't You Be My Neighbor? And we're talking about how, how the church, like you and me and us, can be good neighbors in a countercultural way that makes an impact during a cultural season for us of division and hatred and separation and hostility. And last week we talked about how, how Jesus came in and he redefined what that whole word neighbor means. That it isn't about proximity or affinity or similarity anymore. It's any life your life crashes into who could use some love. We talked about seeing people the way Jesus sees them. This morning, I, I want to lean in to something else I think we have to do if we're going to live out the, this beautiful future that God's inviting us to, this future-generating, incredible, powerful lives and mission that he assigned to the church, and that's serving people like Jesus served them. Like this series, the, the title, Won't You Go Neighbor, sounds so warm and fuzzy, just like all the sweaters Mr. Rogers wore on the show, but it's not. Like, this stuff is just not for the faint of heart. Following Jesus, the thing about it is it's just really simple. Like, just surrender. Like, I'll surrender to him as Lord and Savior. If you're thinking, like, hey, I'm, I'm into that, good, you're, you're in. It's really simple, but it's not very easy. It's not easy to, to walk the path Jesus invites us to walk. It's not easy to live out the call that he placed on his church. In fact, it's impossible to get it right 100% of the time. Know how I know? How'd you do yesterday? I didn't nail it. How'd you do this morning? How'd that go? Some of you got greeted when you walked in the door this morning and someone said, how are you doing? He said, oh, good, I'm feeling so fast. Liars. I know you almost stabbed each other on the drive here and choked your kids. Then you parked and you put on your church face and walked in the doors. We all have done it. Like, it's hard sometimes to live this life that Jesus is calling us to. But I'm convinced, like, if God really did become one of us, if Jesus really did for us what Jesus really did for us, then we have this burden to share that with the world around us, even when it's not easy. And I want to lean into that for a bit this morning. I want to talk about the implications of Jesus, like the creator of the universe, becoming one of us. If you got Bibles or Bibles, you can open them up to John chapter 1. It's sandwiched right between Luke and Acts. You can queue up the passage in the Revision app. There's this one verse in John chapter 1 that I think just changes the game for everybody forever. Jesus, or John kicks off the chapter talking about Jesus. And he says this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. 
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He skipped out to verse 14. And then John writes, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Like Jesus stepped out of eternity into history. He became human and, and he moved into our neighborhood. I think it's so mind-blowingly cool that John writes this. John, the guy who believed in Jesus and followed him and then doubted Jesus, had no idea what to do after Jesus got crucified, didn't know what he should believe. And then after Jesus rose again, was so convinced about who Jesus was and what that meant for the world that he would not shut up about it, even when the government told him he had to shut up. So he got arrested by the Roman Empire under Emperor Domitian, and they sent him to this exiled prison island called Patmos. And while he was sitting on the island, basically in jail, not free to leave, he had a lot of time to think about all this time he spent with Jesus and, and write some stuff down. And here's John. He's an old man. He's outlived all of the other disciples at this point and most of his friends. And he sits down to write about Jesus. And after all this time, he's still convinced that Jesus was more than a good friend to him, that Jesus was more than a great moral teacher or a good man, that Jesus was the unique son of God. He writes the word became a flash and dwelt among us. She kind of begs the question, why? Why would God bother coming to spend time with us? Jesus actually answers that question later in John. In John chapter 17, John writes about this time he overheard Jesus praying. Jesus is talking to the Father and he says, look, Father, I, I did what I came to do. I pointed the world towards you. I told them who you are. I, I've done the job that you sent me here to do, which is crazy because he hasn't died on the cross yet. He hasn't risen again. What, what does he mean by that when, he, when he's praying that prayer? What he's saying is, I came to explain God to mankind. I came to show people what God is like in a real and tangible way. I came to, came to take the guesswork out of God. And that's exactly what I've done. But check it out. Jesus didn't claim to have the best explanation for what God is like. Jesus claimed to be the best explanation for what God is like. Late in his life, one of the disciples looked at him. He's like, Jesus, can you just show us the Father? You've been talking about the kingdom. You've been talking about this way of love. You've been telling us all, all this stuff. Can, can you just please show us God? And Jesus looked at him. He's like, Philip, Phil. Philly, Phil, Phil, bro, you've seen me. You've seen God. That's what it is. And Jesus didn't just demonstrate what God was like. He demonstrated who God likes. I'll say that again because it's important. Jesus didn't just come and demonstrate what God was like. He came and demonstrated who God likes. And it was pretty shocking to people in the first century because they had never heard or thought about God and the type of categories Jesus was using to describe him. And I know some of you may be sitting here right now and you're not sure what you think about Christianity. You're on some sort of a faith journey, but you don't know if you buy into this whole Jesus thing, this whole Christianity thing. But wherever you're at along your journey, you've got to understand this. There's these ideas floating around in our culture that God is love, that everyone has value and everyone matters to God, that God loves people. Those ideas are uniquely Christian ideas in the history of the world. Nobody, anywhere, ever wrote that down or said that before this weird carpenter from Nazareth started talking. Like the gods of the pagans and the Romans and the Greeks, they didn't love people. They hated people. They tolerated people at, at best. And then Jesus showed up and said, no, 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 that's not how it works at all. So this cultural idea that we have floating around, that like if there is a God, God probably likes people and cares about them and every life matters to God. It comes straight from the mouth of Jesus. And Jesus said, not only does God love everybody, everybody means not just Jews, which was pretty jarring for his first century Jewish audience that was pretty convinced God only loved Jews up to that point. And to compound like, the confusion, to understand the the mental gymnastics and the cognitive dissonance that had to happen for all those people listening to Jesus when he said every life has value. we got to get something about their culture. They lived in a slave culture. In the Roman Empire, there were more slaves than there were citizens. Slavery was like, it was an assumption. It was a thing. It wasn't even a social issue. It was just the way the world worked. It was a part of life. And here's the thing. A slave culture devalues everyone's humanity. Because every person is one stroke 
of bad luck away from becoming a slave. If your tribe got conquered, if your city got conquered, if your husband died, if you got hurt, your debts piled up, you could be owned by someone else. Every person living in the Roman world had the potential to be someone else's property at any moment. And here's what that means. Every life had economic value, but nobody had inherent value. When Jesus came along and said, no, he turned the whole thing upside down. The crazy part is even the Jewish religious leaders, the, the priests and the Pharisees, they had the Old Testament. They should have figured out that people mattered to God, but they didn't. They created this like karmic caste system that kept like the disabled and the sick and the lepers and the poor and the women away and out of the temple. They started preaching this idea to everybody around them that what God favored was wealthy, powerful men. And whatever you were experiencing in life, if you experienced misfortune, if you were crippled, if you were hurting, if you were sick, that was God's judgment on you or on your parents for your own failures. Everybody got what they deserved. So compassion in this society wasn't only not necessary, it was ridiculous. Life is a meritocracy metered out by God. How, how silly would it be for me to try and trump God's system? Everybody in the world has exactly what they deserve. And along came this crazy rabbi from Galilee. And everywhere he went, he elevated the dignity of every life that he crashed into. He kept on acting like showing compassion was an act of strength and not an act of weakness. Like there, there might be some worth or value in doing things for people that would never be repaid. And then he acted like every human being had an inherent worth. Not tied to their skill set or their economic value, but stamped on their soul by a God who created them in his image. And the future for, for the poor and the sick and the marginalized dramatically changed for the entire history of the Western world. The course of direction of uh, the way women got treated in society dramatically changed because of the way Jesus treated them. Jesus walked along and treated women like they were full of human beings, which ran in the exact opposite direction of every culture in the world around him. And he said all kinds of crazy stuff constantly that stunned his audience into silence. He told this story once where a Samaritan, like this, this dirty half-breed that you can't even talk to, the Samaritan was the hero and not the Jewish religious leaders. And that story changed everything. Because he ripped the whole definition of what neighbor means away from its roots as it is being located in culture and being located in a place. And he said, no, 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 no. For everybody, everywhere, in every culture, forever, your neighbor isn't about who's next to you or who looks like you or has the same background as you. Your neighbor is any life you crash into that could use some love. And then he invited people to get in the neighbor loving business. If you're new here, or you weren't here last week, that hashtag is probably confusing to you. But I like it. It's our hashtag for the series. Put it on social media. People ask you questions about that. But Jesus like, look, when you see a need, do some neighbor loving, all right? And later he told this series of like three stories about lost things. It's like, hey, you lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. And what he seemed to be saying when he talked about lost stuff was that, that God actually doesn't chase down sinners to punish them. God chases down sinners to reconcile them. That, that for God, he, he's going after sinners not to pay them back, but to win them back. Jesus talked about enemies. And he's like, yeah, you've heard eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's bullcrap. Stop. Stop. God sees them the same way that he sees you. You're broken and you're hurting and you have need. And if that's the way God sees them, that's the way you should see them. Pray for your enemies. Do nice things for people who would never ever pay you back because they hate you. That's how I want you to treat them. I want you to treat people the way, no, no, not the way you want them to treat you, but the way I treated you. That raises the bar. He took the golden rule, treat others as you want to be treated. He said, forget that. Treat others as God through Christ has treated you. One time he took his disciples to the temple and they're watching all these people like dumping money into the, into the big coffers and he watches these rich wealthy dudes dumping a whole lot of money. And then this widow stumbles up and she drops in a single coin and Jesus pulls the guys together. He's like, fellas, she gave more. And they had to use the same amount of Jesus that I used on the SiriusXM guy. Like, Jesus, 
I'm not a math doctor, but I, I don't think she did. That's not, that's not right. It's like, oh, you've missed it in the kingdom of God. It's about proportion, not about you. You don't get any credit for the amount you give. You only get credit for the amount of faith it took you to give, and she gave more. Jesus not only said all this crazy stuff, he did crazy stuff. And I'm a pretty big proponent of the idea that if you want to see what someone means by what they say, look at what they do. And Jesus constantly did things that turned the world upside down. In a culture where, where cleanliness was very literally next to godliness, Jesus was like, dirty hands could be holy hands. And he touched people. He had a conversation with a Samaritan woman. That's two strikes. One more and he's out. Like, and, and, and he walked along and he, and he not only healed sick people, he, he, like, he touched sick people. And that was nuts. Because the priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all the religious people of that day would never, ever touch a sick person. Because if you touch a sick person, I get this as a germaphobe, I can wrap my mind around it. You get sick. Just don't, I don't like to touch my kids when they're sick. Just don't touch sick people. And also you get unclean religiously. And Jesus walked along and he saw blind people and lepers and he kept on touching them. This crazy thing happened. Every time he touched sick people, not only did he not get sick, they got well. One day he's walking along and he just, like, he always saw people in the margins. He sees this tax collector sitting by the side of the road. And he's like, Matthew, I'm going to come hang out with you. And a tax collector in that day and age is basically a traitor to his people and a thief. And Jesus not only hangs out with this guy, he's like, you know what? And you should be like one of my main guys. You can write a book. More people will read it than any other book in the history of the world. What do you think? And even at that point, like his disciples, these guys were fishermen so far. Like he plucked them off the shores. They're like, a tax collector? Jesus, now, nope, that's too far. Can't be hanging out with, with a guy like that. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. You don't get it. Something new is happening in, in the world. God is showing people what God is like and who God likes. And from now on, we're not defining people anymore by their economic value. We're not defining people anymore by what they've done or what's been done to them. We are defining them by the fact that they're created in the image of God. But Jesus constantly went out of his way to declare the value of people society had decided had no value. Like after he rose and he ascended back into heaven, the disciples got it. They got it and no, they did. Here's how. The first problem that ever arose in the history of the church was that they couldn't get Peter and John and James and all the guys to stop serving the widows and walking around Jerusalem making sure every hungry person had something to eat. You read about it in Acts 6. The church, these other people come to them and they're like, hey, guys, this is great. And if you thought you were better than us and if you thought like you were too good to do the small task, we maybe like wouldn't want to follow you and be all in. But the thing is, we kind of need you to lead right now. We need you to, like, you were with Jesus. We need you to preach, and we need you to teach. We need you to do some of the stuff that only you can do, and the whole, like, feeding the poor thing. The rest of it, we'll just all get together, and we'll do the stuff we can do, and then we can all have a role. But you got to quit doing that. We need you to do the stuff only you can do. And Acts 6 talks about how the, the whole church had to come to them and just pry them away from that task, because they got it. They understood that Jesus had ripped every excuse for not serving the poor and the needy and the marginalized out from under their feet. The whole church got it. That's, this is like the foundation of this movement we call the church in the world. It's what it's built on. No strings attached. Compassion and generosity was the calling card of the church in the first century. This is some of the coolest history that we never actually learn about in school. But like in the first century when, when plagues and disease hit the cities. And that happened a lot back then. Everyone would leave. Like anyone with, with the wealth and the ability would just bail on the city so they wouldn't get sick and die. But the church decided we need to stay. We need to stay and feed the poor who can't leave and nurse the sick who can't move and bury the dead because they have dignity. And thousands of years later we look back and the crazy thing is historians and doctors estimate that the fact that Christians were willing to stay, you know why they were willing to stay? They believed in the resurrection. They weren't afraid to die at all. But the fact that Christians were willing to stay, even though a whole lot of the time, they died right alongside the people they were helping and burying. The fact that they were willing to stay saved countless lives and rewrote the future of the European continent. And not so much because they were nursing people back to health, but because they buried the dead bodies. 
Instead of letting them sit there and rot and fester in the city and letting the disease continue to spread through the dead bodies, they put them under the ground. And what we know now is that that cut off the outbreaks exponentially faster than it would have if they were just left to rot. And the cool thing is they didn't even know that. That's not why they were there. They were there because people had value and death had no victory. In the first century, it wasn't even illegal for, for parents with a kid they didn't want. Like if you had a kid that had special needs, wants to deal with that. You just put them, put them out in the woods. If you had a kid that was the wrong gender, you know, you're really excited for that first baby that pops out, and whoop, girl, just put them in the woods. It was called exposing them. And this was a thing in Roman society. It wasn't taboo. It wasn't illegal. You could go leave them by the river or at the edge of the woods and then expose them to the fates. Just like, you know, fate is going to decide. If the baby freezes to death, Fate is out of that. If it gets eaten, kidnapped, whatever, that's, that's not my thing. I didn't kill the baby. Fate decided. Because kids are inconvenient. Everyone in here who has a kid will tell you kids are terribly inconvenient. Every society in the history of the world has come up with some self-justification for infanticide for the sake of their own convenience. Everyone. And the Romans did too. They're like, you know, just, just put them with fate. Fate will, fate will do it. And then Christians came along and like, this is not okay. It's not okay. And they went to the edge of the river, and they went to the woods, and they picked up these babies, and they brought them home, and they raised them as their own, even when they did not have the space or the money to do it, because they believed that's what Jesus would do. And they were convinced that the church ought to look like Jesus to a watching world. And a couple hundred years later, Emperor Constantine actually became a Christian, and Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire, one of the first laws he passed was to make exposing babies and children a capital offense. She said, this is not, this is not okay. Jesus shaped the conscience of the Roman Empire. And he shaped the conscience of our culture as well. We have this idea politically. Like, even in an era where, where politically no one seems to be able to even talk to each other. Like, Democrats and Republicans, blue and red, progressives and conservatives, they all hate each other and yell past each other. But all of them are working from this idea that the government ought to do what is best for people because what is best for people is best. And even if we don't agree on what is best for people, we agree that what's best for people is what's best. And Jesus said that. The idea that we have in this culture that every man, woman, and child, rich or poor, red, yellow, black, or white, able or disabled, has an inherent dignity, this idea is not natural. We can read back through world history and know it doesn't just pop up. The fact that we believe it in this culture is a shadow. It's a, it's a leftover of the teachings of Jesus. That's the story of the last 2,000 years of, of the world. What do we do with that as the church in the 21st century? I think we need to live out the legacy of the church in the first century. Our lives and our community ought to reflect loudly to a broken, shattered world that every person matters to God. And I get it because Jesus promised this. Like, we will never stop being criticized or ridiculed for, for what we believe, for being people of faith. People are going to always say, that, that's superstitious and dumb and not true. It is true. That's, that's fine. But what if, what if even though that's going to be the case, and, and not everyone's going to agree with us, what if we got famous for our compassion and our generosity and love? What if, like, people looked at... Revision Church in the city of Mormon, they're like, those, they're crazy, but what would we do without them? I'm 100% okay with that, because I think that's the model our Savior left us. And my guess is there's a whole lot of you out there who, who hear that and you think the same thing. You think, yeah, I'm okay with that. That's what I want to do. I want to live the love of Jesus to a, a hurting world. I want to live into this, this beautiful, incredible, eternity rewriting future. God says that I'm made for. I want to be a part of a church like that. So what do we do? Well, in Matthew 25, kind of at the end of his life, Jesus gave us some, some marching orders. He's talking about the end of the world, and just, just the end of all things. He said this, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And the righteous ones are, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did 
for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine you did for me. Then I'll say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or need clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? And he will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do, for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Being a good neighbor to all the people our lives crash into every day to do some love matters deeply to the heart of God. That's why we do reach the morning. Yeah, like we try to live this out 24-7, 365, and in our lives, in our jobs, in our schools, everywhere we go, in our house groups, but a few times a year, we all come together as, as a big body. We cancel our services, and we give away a whole bunch of money rather than receiving an offering. And we spread out around the city to partner with organizations that are feeding people who are hungry, clothing people who need clothes, visiting the isolated, and helping Des Moines flourish. And as we prepare to do that again in a few weeks, like at the end of, of this month, we just talked about the why. Jesus is the why. We can't help it. Jesus is the why. But I, I want to briefly close this morning by talking about the, the how. And not exactly like the how do we do these projects. How do I rate? I don't, I'm not even good at that. I am dumb. I can't tell you that. But like the how we think about what we're doing. Because it matters. I think so often when we hear about the life of Jesus and the compassion that he showed and the value and dignity he added to the lives of everyone around him, we hear about the early church and how radically and ridiculously they lived this out and the passion that they had. Our, our minds go to this place of, of, of thinking about serving others as providing them with things they don't have. Like they don't have fill in the blank, so we give them fill in the blank. And we live in this wildly materialistic society. Uh, Americans think about and through everything in terms of stuff, materials, what we have and don't have. And even Jesus' formula in Matthew 25, I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me water, helps us continue to, to think that way. Most Americans define the word poverty as a lack of something material. But there were a bunch of researchers recently. They surveyed 60,000 impoverished people in developing world countries. And what they discovered is that isn't how they define poverty at all. It's not about things, it's about thinking. For them, poverty was a mindset. It wasn't a lack of anything material. They never said, well, I'm impoverished because I don't have. They said, I'm impoverished because I feel hopeless, worthless, and helpless. And the word that popped up most often was the word fear. It's a constant state of fear. And so I think we need to understand if we're going to serve people who are struggling the way Jesus served them. It isn't about giving them a few things or doing a few things for them. It's about showing love in a way that affirms and creates dignity and value in their lives. Like that's what happened for us when the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God like, stepped in to our brokenness and He brought healing and, and love and reconciliation. So that's what we need to do for our community. And there are three simple like practical mindsets that I think reflect the way Jesus did this the way Jesus taught us to do this, that, that if we're going to like get in the countercultural neighbor-loving business, if we're going to live out this charge in Matthew 25, we've we got to think this way about what we're doing. The first one is this. Being a neighbor means serving people, not saving people. I think it's dangerous and insulting to think that we are the solution to anybody's problems and that we have the power to save them. Jesus is the solution. We're the servants. The Holy Spirit is the power. We're, we're the conduits through which it flows. Jesus saves and we serve. We give and we get out of the way because we are not the hero of this story. We're people who the hero has rescued. I love the way the rapper the prayer puts it. He said, I am a trail of stardust pointing to the superstar. That's what we're doing. The second mindset is this. Being a neighbor means seeing people and not seeing projects. This is what matters so much. It's Hey, easier. I know it is in my life. It's way easier to see people, especially like broken people and marginalized people and people who are like really difficult to love. It's way easier to see them as projects that need to be solved rather than people that need to be loved. But I think there are so many people in our city who are just yearning, who are desperate, not for someone to come fix them, but for someone to come be with them. 
Like Jesus never treated people like projects. He knew them, and he heard them, and he listened to them, and he sat with them, and he loved them. And this is one, I, was, I can admit, I've, I've blown this as a leader so many times. So many times I saw a, a project out there, and I thought, I can fix that. And I set the wheels in motion to, to like do something that would solve some problem without even asking my project whether that was what they wanted. This is part of the reason for Reason One we partner with other organizations. We're not trying to be the hero. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. I want to partner with organizations who are walking out into this city and actually asking people, what is it that we can do to help you achieve your dreams? And I want to do that stuff. I want to love those people. I want to be with those people. Because that's the place where we start seeing people and, and not projects. People to be with and, and not problems to solve. That's the place where God does some of his best work. Not just in our hearts, or not just in their hearts, but in ours as well. And the final one is this. Being a neighbor means reaching out, not reaching down. Sometimes when we serve, it's easy to fall in this condescending mindset, like we're better than the people we're serving. That's such a bunch of garbage. Like we reach out because we care, because Jesus cared about us. We don't reach down because we're better than everyone else. Like reaching down is this way of coming to people and saying, I have the answers and I have the ability and you have nothing. Reaching out is saying, look, I'm broken too. I am a fellow struggler along the journey, but Jesus changed everything for me, so I'm just give you what I got. Here's what I got. I love the way the, the researcher and sociologist, Brene Brown, puts it. She writes this. We have divided the world into those who need help and those who offer help, but the truth is we are both. We're both. I, that's the whole precursor to coming to Jesus, saying, Jesus, I need, I need help. I, I can't do this. On my own. So this mindset of reaching out, not reaching down, means understanding we have something to offer, but also something to receive from every other life on this planet. So living this out, like living out this radical call of Jesus in Matthew 25, it means serving people, not saving people, seeing people, not seeing projects, and reaching out, not reaching down. This is the model Jesus gave us. It's the legacy and the history of this movement that we're all a part of called the church. what we were created for. It's how we can be neighbors in a way that makes a countercultural impact on our city during an era and a time of deep division in our country. We're crashing into people every single day. Every single day. We're desperate for the love of Jesus. People he loves and people he died for and people he says are valuable because he created them in his image and he's inviting us to see them and to serve them. And I think if we do, if we can make this a lifestyle, we can change the flavor. We can change the flavor of this city. So let's do it. And today I got a, a real simple application step. Real practical. If we're going to make this into a lifestyle in a way that changes the flavor, here's step one. Again, it's simple. It may not be easy, but it's simple. I got a real simple ask of everybody in the room this morning. Reach Des Moines is coming up on September 30th. We're canceling our services. We're spreading around the city to serve. <laughs> I'm asking you for your time that Sunday morning. I know it's really easy on a Sunday where you've got to pour out rather than being filled up to just skip that one. To do your errands, to, to get some stuff done around the house that you need done around the house. But I'm, I'm asking you to consider for a second what it means that the God of the universe got real low and became a neighbor to you by getting up under your problems. And what it means that he's invited you to go do the same thing. To become a neighbor to the people of the moment by getting real low and serving, getting up under their problems. After the service, we're gonna have people all around the room. They're wearing t-shirts that are black, with like bright pink, you can't miss them. Don't lie to me later, unless you're colorblind. I'll find out, don't lie. But you can't miss them, right? They, they say reach them on. They're gonna be able to tell you about the service and help you get signed up, and I'm asking 100% of you to give. I'm not asking you to give 100%. That's different, but I'm asking 100% of you to give some time one Sunday morning to be the neighbors God made us to be. The neighbors Jesus showed us how to be. So I think if we do, we can change the flavor of this thing. We guys pray? Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love. Thank you for being a neighbor to us. Thank you for just coming down. We didn't deserve it when we were broken. We were hopeless for stepping into our story. For becoming flesh and, and dwelling with us. For showing us not just who you are, but, but how you love and, and who you love. Lord, it's not always easy. 
It's hard because it's messy and it's, it's selfless and it goes against all of our instincts, but would you just create in us your heart? Would you give us your eyes to see so that we can walk out into a broken world and just show people the love that you've given us to change everything about who we are? Would you give us the ability to, to change the flavor of a city by loving people? Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.